Gorgeous people. It's nice to see everyone. I have a special, special guest here tonight, and I have ulterior motives um, for asking Mark on this call. I basically, and I'm spoiled. I have a lot of narrator friends and many, many male narrators that I just admire the hell out of, but I developed a thing for time travel books. I love a time travel book because it's pure escapism to me. And I was telling Mark before the call that I think ever since I, I listened to, and I'm going to mangle the name because I can never, never remember the title, but um, Stephen King did a time travel book and it was, it was really long and I had a horrible job and I used to listen to that book at work and just ignore people. And it was the ultimate escapism. And so now whenever I feel the need to like, kind of like not think about life, I'll look for a time travel book. And a couple of months ago, I think it was, I happened to cross, you're going to have to help me with name because I am just, I butcher names. What was the name of the two books you did for the? Uh, so the two books by Adam Eccles that I've done so far are called Need a Little Time yep. and um, System Restored. Yeah, and he's he, he's written other books that are yet to be uh, audio books, but those, those are the two book, audio books uh, you can get by Adam Eccles. And in case he watches this, could you please hurry and get Mark to do the other books? <laughs> because <laughs> so basically, I listened to Need a Little Time, and and the thing that struck me, I want to go back further because I have a mm -hmm. lot of questions, but I want to preface with the reason I reached out to you was because you think that the more books you do, the more experience you have, you'll be kind of unstoppable as a narrator. And right. there was something I couldn't pin down. I got to like 170 or something books. And I was like, I'm, am I getting worse? I mean, I would, I would like listen to like the first few ones I did, and you know, aside for editing, it was like, I was like, there was something special and like where's my special i've lost my special and i've had all the coaching and tried and you approached your narration and i i think i was i think i kind of might have gone on a bit about that book while i was like still listening to it on my joe interviews with other people <laughs> because <laughs> you you there was an underlying energy in your narration that I can only describe as it, it made me happy. You were a happy person. I wanted to spend time with this narrator. I wanted to hear the rest of the story because this narrator was bringing joy to the book and also slick professionalism with no weird pickup sounds and oddities, which I'm finding more and more in a lot of big books. I'm, I would never name and shame, but it could be because after a while you listen to so many and you're doing them, you become hypercritical. But yours, it was the first time in a very long time I was able to just completely lose myself and, and remember the, the feeling of being that listener without right. the me, this is my job in my head all the time analyzing. And mm -hmm. you did something with energy. And so to talk about that and get to that, because... I have ulterior motives that I have every intention of figuring out what your secret is and hacking it. So 10-year-old right. Mark, huh. can you please tell me about 10-year-old Mark? Because I have a theory that it all starts around that age. What were you thinking? Were you living in the moment? Where were you? Where were you growing up? Um, so I grew up uh, just outside uh, Liverpool. Um, first of all, in a place called Waterloo outside of Liverpool and then we moved a bit more into Crosby which I guess is slightly a uh, little bit tiny bit posher than Waterloo <laughs> uh, when I think I, so I think that that move was when I was 10 actually 
um, and I'd gone to a primary school called St Nicholas. Uh, this is all uh, it's all kind of by the by the sea by the sea. Uh, oh, wow. Five miles um, up the coast from Liverpool, and um, I'd start. I'd already by ten switched from doing judo on a Saturday morning to going to youth, youth theatre. And I, I'm, I'm quite sporty in general, but I didn't really love judo. Uh, you had to do lots of forward rolls, which kind of made me dizzy. And at one point, I broke my big toe because it got oh. stuck in the mess. And they made me for the. <laughs> I kept having to fight this girl who was in my school called Claire for uh, all the exams and that didn't sit right with me at the time <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so I was quite, so when the opportunity to go to youth theatre on a Saturday morning came up I, I jumped at that and um, yeah so I think I was already doing that uh, by, by 10 as well as kind of riding my bike around and playing a lot of football with my best friend who, who though, come to think of it, he, he died when I was 10. Oh, uh, oh which God. Was, uh, which I guess was a thing. And, um, was there like an accident or, I mean, I don't want to bring back bad memories. No, but... he was, um, he was, uh, he, he was ill a lot and, um, he it was it was sold to me that he was he, he was now a, a piece and uh, it was all sort of better in in some way uh that i didn't necessarily subscribe to at the time yeah because or, 10 year olds i think it, i think when we're 10 is when we start to become our wisest selves it's hard to put something past us yeah it was it was um yeah, obviously it was the thing, and also because um, going to his funeral uh, was an odd experience, just because he, they, they, their family was Catholic and mine was Protestant, so it was a it was a service that was very different from anything I'd experienced. Um, the kind of formality and the altar boys and the people singing and the ins it was all uh, and um, yeah, this kind of thing of oh, you know, it's all right because he's gone to heaven good uh <laughs> yeah so so that was uh, yeah that was a lot of the stuff that was going on for me at 10 i guess I, how did that I was, feel as a child though did that kind of take away some of your happiness as a child did it make you well, grow up faster that, i think look i think the fact that i was already I, I was thinking about this the other day that um so when i went to secondary school at 11 we had a, a play competition in which each class did a play and um, and my class won and I and I and I and I won the best actor but even at 11 I thought well well I should have won that because I've, I've been doing youth theatre for a couple of years so it would really be a bit embarrassing if I hadn't have won it because I've got a lot more experience than these all these other 11 year olds so I didn't really, I didn't really get any joy out of it, which, which looking back, seems a bit of a shame. And I think, I think that's that that that's kind of happened throughout my career. Uh, that I, I perhaps could have had more joy in my achievements. See the, see the, 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 the British, the, the, and it's so funny because remember, most of your audience is Americans. Right. Um, the people that are going to watch it on YouTube and everything. And I have to say, mm -hmm. um, Anna, Jonathan, anyway, if you guys have questions, quirky questions, the quirkier, the better, feel free to put them in the chat box and I will put them through to Mark throughout the call. But um, there's a self-deprecating thing over here. Um, mm -hmm. And I think part of what it makes you guys work harder at your craft and become better actors but then sometimes oh. I just want to say, tell the world how good you are. Scream <laughs> it from the top. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I, I, I often wonder if, so I, one of the, really, you know, I never really had any other ambition of anything else than to be an actor. And I kind of pursued it doggedly and slightly stubbornly 
and that's kind of what I did. And I wonder, I sometimes wonder if I'd allow myself to form other ambitions, do other things. But already by, um, you asked about being 10, but I, I, so I feel like maybe already by 10, 11, that's what I wanted to do. And by the time I was 14, 15, I'd read a lot of books about how to be an actor that normally had a stern, a stern preface or introduction by Judy Dench that said, there's no way you can be an actor. It's impossible. There's too many people. You, and just because, you're, just because you think you're good in your school play, that doesn't mean anything. That's not the profession. And, and actually, turns out Judy Dench isn't at all stern or uh, critical. <laughs> but uh, I just thought, who's this, this, this dragon of a lady who's telling me that my school plays um, aren't important? And, I, you, you know, so that even, I, I don't think I really enjoyed them because I just thought, well, you know, however good I am in my school play at 15, 16, 17, it's not, it's not the business, it's not the profession. Oh, that's, the, yeah, I do that. I count. still do that. I still do that. And do yeah. you ever find that you change the goalpost? Because I'll do that. Like I have to work. I I complained. I was like, I have to work for a particular publisher. I was like, know. it's not good enough until I work for that publisher. And my yeah. friends won't let me forget this. It took me yeah. four years. And now I work or I got jobs for that publisher. And guess what? I didn't take one second. <laughs> yeah. Of thinking, I mean, I was like, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> I really remember, I, I, I think I, I, at one point I had like two TV credits and I remember thinking, if I had five, yes, I would just, I thought I would I would do that. <laughs> I would, <laughs> so, and then now, now I have over 20 and I don't feel any different. Um, Jonathan wants to know, what's your favorite genre to narrate? Like your favorite, favorite? Um... Uh, I pass. I don't know. Um, I do. I'm. Hmm. I I think I'm much better at, at characters. So as long as there's lots of different people talking to each other. Um, and I, you I, don't I, make the women sound stupid. Thank you for that. <laughs> because yeah. because the, 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 the women basically are me. I'm I'm the women. Yeah. The, the women. The women have my voice. They're real people with personalities <laughs> and thoughts and motives. But a lot of people think just make her sound higher at the end of every sentence. That's not that simple. It, oh, no, so what, I, so what I do is I, I the, the, the women are all versions of me, and the men are the men. The men are the people with stupid voices. I love that. I love that because it's not. I love that because the women. It's not jarring. It feels right. natural listening to it. Um, John, oh, I will get to that question, Jonathan. I'm going to lead up to it a little bit. So um, so you're on this dogged pursuit to act. Yeah. At any point, did you swerve and end up being like a lorry man or a, a you know, bin guy or work in a retail um, shop because you lost? Only, only in order to facilitate survival yeah. jobs yeah 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 and um you know and I, I i i spend a lot of time wondering what else i could have done i'm every single person i meet i'm fascinated by what they do and think oh, maybe maybe i could have done that instead and, and been happier and have more money or whatever um but i yeah you know i can't i can't really remember i mean going back to your question about being 10 i can't i can't really remember the time before wanting to be an actor and and and, and just seeing everything through that lens in, including my personality and how i react to every single thing in the world uh <laughs> which is maybe not the most healthy way of of reacting to the world but you know everything's been through the prism of um how does that help me yeah, and who's healthy these days anyway? You know, and okay, so I've got, and, and that's a good one too, Anna. So I've got some questions from Jonathan and Anna, but I'm going to put them in when we get to that. So mm -hmm. what do you do better or differently? What's different about you than everyone else in the world? Um, okay, so I feel that, um, let me think about that. I've... 
I can do it. I, I do. I do kind of extremes quite well. I think so that. Um, uh, I, I, I did a TV series once that the way it fell out was that in the first episode, I was a very sort of normal, boring guy um, who just seemed to be uh, a witness to a crime. And then by episode five, it turned out that actually all the different story thre uh, threads were all me. Uh, what series I, was it? Do you mind? It was, it was called WPC 56 and um, they, 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 were, they were investigating a kind of number of different, they were investigating a, 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 a historical case of kids going missing and some bones that had been found, but also there were some women being dragged into bushes and then there was uh, something else. And basically in episode five, it turned out there was all me and I was a weirdo and not only that, but I, I, I was doubly weird for having having reported one of the cases in the first place. You were uh, the psycho. So you were the psycho. So, uh, so and and what was funny about it was that that people even in the car in in the rest of the cast and crew didn't realise that it that it that it was me <laughs> that they somehow didn't know. And I remember quite a few people saying to me uh, in the cast and crew saying, "Oh, it's really interesting that you're doing this because." because you seem like such a normal guy um, in, in when we first met you and now we're slightly terrified of you and you seem very odd and um, and I just kind of thought well that's that 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 so I guess I feel like I'm slightly an old-fashioned sort of actor like a transformational actor um, who doesn't have um, like I'm not like, like you wouldn't pick me out of a crowd uh, in, in, in normal life where you wouldn't say, oh, that's a fascinating individual over there. But, like a shapeshifter, like you can yeah, metamorphize yeah, I, into the character. Yeah, and I and, 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 and you'd probably never guess from meeting me in real life that, that, that I would do kind of more extreme characters because that doesn't seem... And then, and so, uh, and so people were a bit like, oh, I thought... I, I, I sometimes like, feel like people are disappointed with me off stage because I'm not quite as interesting and wacky and out there as the character that I've just been playing. I think it's um, more interesting because that means that you off stage is another character because you're not showing the depths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a nice way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Okay, so you're plodding along and not plodding. You're you're going mm. along with your life. You're following your dream. You're you sound like quite a happy-ish person most of your life. Kind of well balanced. And I mean, did you have any dark nights of the soul? Any battles I have, or? Yeah, I mean, that, I suppose that's the other thing is that I feel like I, I just going on feedback. I feel like I uh, people think I'm not. <laughs> a lot going on but i i feel like i'm i'm overreacting to everything uh, all day every day i'm yeah i know uh, that feeling lo loving things and hating things and I, I feel i feel like i walk around with my skin off um and it's wonderful and terrible but not all of that uh, really comes across so i don't i don't seem like a really dramatic vulnerable person um and maybe i'm quite good at pretending not to be so i guess that's quite kind of british as well it's um, the depths i <laughs> love the depth so okay so so you by night you're this like wild actor that can follow <laughs> the extremes and then by day you play normal citizen joe and mm. Then you're acting, acting, acting. Tell me about this three-year acting class award thing. How did you first hear about it? How did it come up, up uh, you know, and were you nervous? Did you have to prepare? Were you freaking out before? So I, um, so I, one of the few people now of my, of my sort of generation, and maybe people did it uh, uh, previously, you, you couldn't do... You couldn't do a acting de degree, a degree in acting, um, when I wanted to go to drama school, and and now and now you can. 
so uh, after a certain year, which I can't tell you what it is, um, everybody's been able to go to drama school to do a degree in acting and, there, and therefore uh, find the funding for it or whatever, whatever. Right. Uh, and and then a bit before I went to drama school, you, you were able to get funding just to go to drama school. And so I, I was in a kind of in-between time um, where it was really quite difficult to get funding to go to drama school. And my parents wanted me to go to university and have a degree to to fall back on that, that kind of whole thing. Um, and that was, I, I, I sort of see that as a, a waste of time in, 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 in some ways, although, of course. Yeah, my really parents, the day I found out that their dream really was that I could have a backup career as a dental hygienist, <laughs> just so I could get government, like, you know, insurance yeah. and everything. I was so offended. I did a Kathy and Heathcliff. You don't know me at all. Yeah. Well, I, it was. It, it just felt like a hoop that I had to jump through. I mean, it was. It was ridiculous, really, because I did it. I did a degree in in um, English and drama, so you know, yeah. one of these pointless degrees you can do. It's and, like, fine, uh, I'll take your box. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and I, and because very early on, I, I wanted to train as an actor when I did my degree I, I chose all sorts of things that weren't acting so like 25% uh, of my de degree was choreography um, because I wanted to do the acting at, at drama school so but then but then by then that point I'd exhausted any sort of any mo money that I might get given um, so I was put forward for uh, an evening standard award uh, where any, anyone, uh, each drama school could nominate one person um, to, to 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 audition for that, and there was an initial round uh, of like twenty five people or whatever, and then I got into the final five or whatever it was. So and, how did that um, feel? So so were you really nervous? Were you making a big deal in your head about yeah, I mean, it? I'm, I'm, I'm terrible at auditions. I, I hate them had one today, it was hideous, can't control my body uh, or my speech or what I say. Um, but this, the second round was uh, uh, judged by a panel led by uh, Judy Dench, <laughs> ironically. And, um, and I, and I, I, and I'd read in, in, in audition books that you shouldn't clock, you shouldn't, you shouldn't directly address the audition panel. You shouldn't look them in their eyes. Yeah, and I thought, do you know, what? I'm gonna do that. And um, I had a speech, and in w which was sort of uh, my Shakespeare speech was addressed to uh, the, the princess or whatever. And I made Judy Dench that, and I did the in entire speech addressed uh, directly to her, which I'd sort of been told not to do. Why but do they say not to do that? Because it never made sense to me. Because it's human I, connection. I think it may, uh, the idea is that it makes the audition panel uncomfortable. I should also say that the uh, the principal of the drama school had spent quite a lot of time uh, rehearsing with me. But what was interesting about that was that what he rehearsed was entering the room. So I would be outside the room and I'd come into the room and say my name and what audition speeches I was going to do. And he was like, great, now do it again. And we basically practiced coming in to the audition room we didn't we didn't actually practice the speeches at all we just practiced coming into the room but, but think, and, about, uh, think about that that's your pre you were practicing your presence yeah 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 which I is mean, what I, was, I heard in your narration yeah which and is so, but it was also it was also practice that thing of like not 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 apologizing for yourself not feeling bad not not messing everything up by feeling so kind of like you know and speaking too quick yeah. you know it's just kind of going, here i am this is me this is what i'm going to do and yeah. then you know and I, so i thought that was kind of really clever that he did that and so so i got so i got an evening standard award selected by uh judy dench no 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 wait okay sorry i don't mean to keep stopping you but i need more i need more here what do you mean you got it? Were you like at home doing the dishes and the phone rang and you dropped the no, food all so, over the well, place? It was, really, it was dead old fashioned because I literally phoned, I had to phone up the editor of the Evening Standard, who at the time was a guy called Max Hastings, who's sort of 
uh, eminent historian as well as editor and and sort of go hello it's I'm calling about you know this is this is how long how ago much it was. long how long after hello. the audition like how long after day I think I think it was I think it was 24 hours later or something what did you think that yeah. night did you think oh I've done pretty well I'm in for a chance or no way do I have this what did you think that night I can't I honestly can't remember what I can remember is that is that this guy was like well we've decided to 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 the, you delighted to say you're the winner or whatever and and we felt that you were the person who who really spoke to us <laughs> you, you, and you, you did you, straight you you really communicated to us so i thought well that you know that that, that gamble paid off ultimately um, um jonathan says oh well the audition what was the audition oh, so i, mean, I basically I basically did two, um, you had to do two speeches, uh, a classical and a modern. So I did, um, so I'd had a year previously of like playing Hamlet and Hotspur and uh, over the time realized that, that that wasn't my casting, that wasn't me. So I would then did a speech, which is uh, Barone from uh, Love Slave Was Lost. So, so he was quite as kind of gossipy. Oh my, well, princess, I've just seen these guys in the park <laughs> and they're saying all of this and that's what's going on. And then I juxtaposed that, uh, if you'll allow me to use that word, um, with a speech from um, the play version of Blood Brothers, uh, oh. which I, uh, which is slightly different from the uh, musical version, which I then, uh many years later ended up playing in 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 the west end playing that character in the west end okay so, so and i and i haven't forgotten your questions anna and jonathan um so you're acting you're acting you're acting mm -hmm. um you're working on your craft obviously so you have to at this point have developed an inner core of confidence what you know that confidence when you know you know what you're doing i mean I think with actors and everything, we always get this bothersome feedback thing, which is like a fact of life and plus the whole audition. So like our job is being constantly rejected, <laughs> like, you know, but yeah. you still have to have an inner confidence in that, you know, in the right conditions, you can deliver what you know you can deliver because you know you've done it. Somebody said to me at one of my low points, they said, Daniela, stop a minute. I think at that point I'd done like 200 audiobooks. Uh, PJ Auckland said this. I was getting a coaching session with him. And he said, 200 times you've auditioned and someone has chosen you. So you can't play small. You can't be like, oh, I, I don't have any confidence. 200 times you've been chosen. But we don't like, I don't know about you, but in this career, we don't notice the times that people choose us we notice the times that people didn't like our haircut or like the one bad review yeah that, but the times they don't choose us are more than the times that they do choose us yeah and, but uh, they're still an honor to be able to audition aren't they they're part of the job we shouldn't even be considering it rejection but it is isn't it <laughs> <laughs> It still hurts. It's like getting dumped. Yeah, but, you know, and, and it's not just that. L listen, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm going to make sure I don't say any particular details, but I auditioned today for an eminent director. And I thought, I hope, I wonder, my, my big fear was that this person would say, have we met before? Because I could say, well, you didn't cast me in 2005 and again in 2010 and that's i that's the ones i remember <laughs> wait no you wouldn't have, but you wouldn't have said that right no i wouldn't have said it but it would have been the only thing that i could have thought and so i would have gone blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> i would have been thinking that but i wouldn't have said it um yeah. and i would have like gone red and felt like i wanted to throw up and um you know, but like even when, because the thing is, is that I, even when you worked with someone before, so I, so I had an audition once where I thought, well, I'm in here because I've worked, I've worked with the director before. So I thought, this is, is going to be, I'm going to breeze this. 
And I went in and the, and the guy said, Mark Ray Soxley, that's an interesting name. And I thought, well, obviously not interesting enough to remember having worked with me before. Uh, so that was a bit of a blow. And, um, you know, you just never know what you're going to get. If people aren't thinking about you or they remember you or they, you, you know. Well. So sometimes I love to, I love to remember that half the time nobody remembers you. Because you get a fresh start every time, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, I, I'm just, I just think I'm not very good at the social chit chat bit, which is a great thing in audiobooks because there's none of that. There is just, there is, there is just the chapter one or whatever it may be. Can you not bring your character into your audition? I don't have any characters. The whole point. The, guy, the guy in that book, I loved him. He was like my, he's like my dear friend. Like I want him to do another book so he can come back. What was his <laughs> name? I can't remember his name. He was confident. He was friendly. Yeah. Can you not like embody the character that you play in the audiobooks? The confident, friendly, chatty. And I do, friendly... I do, but but then I think one of the whole things about acting is that people don't know what they. So I don't know. So if you'd asked that character if he was confident, you'd let him know. Um, oh yeah, good you, point. People don't, people don't. Characters don't know. Characters have no wisdom about themselves. I, th I think. If they, I think if you're huh. kind of dead. I think if your character does have wisdom about themselves, then they, then it's sort of dead, and it becomes a bit kind of arch and a bit kind of intellectual and a bit kind of like, hey, I'm saying some clever stuff. Okay, and, so help me with know? this. That makes sense. Okay, so how? Okay, so that makes sense. So I was going to ask this later, and I was going to ask the other questions. I was I haven't even gotten to how you got into audiobooks and all that, blah blah blah. But I really want to know. So, so I spend my whole time having been an actor. I'm not good at the memorizing the technical details which is why i don't focus a lot on accents because if mm -hmm. i go in the book in the booth and try to think i screw myself up mm -hmm. i take myself right out of it and so i go in there and try to feel like i know the characters and what they would think so i'm feeling like i'm act like i don't know if you've ever done this maybe i'm just crazy but like i used to like when i'd walk to the tube to like go to work and Mm -hmm. London for years I was like mm -hmm. I would whoever I was walking behind I would try to imagine what it felt like to be in their body walk like them move like them mm -hmm. and then I'd like build in my head a story of like what they were I'm probably weird but I would like feel like what it felt like to be them right so that yeah. like if somebody asked me to be that person you can put it in your memory as like the way a person is you know everyone does that but so going into a book he tried to try to feel like what I'm feeling to be the character, but that is a really good point. And it kind of undermines everything I think I've been doing as a narrator my whole entire career. But my character doesn't know that they're tense, type A, such and such. Mm. Well, and then how do know, I do it? And they, don't, they don't know when they're being sexy or, you know, because if you do know that, then then you're not going to be sexy, I reckon. Because you become a caricature. Um, yeah. I, it's, I'm, I can't believe I'm going to say this because I promised myself never to tell anybody um, out loud. Don't worry, we oh. can edit it out if you regret it tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not really, it's not that I'm going to regret it. It's just, it's just really sort of act as nonsense. One of my proudest acting moments was when I nearly got run over by a car because I felt like I was so in the character that I was thinking about at the time, because I, Mark, would never get run over by a car because I'm super careful and I'm very on it and I'm looking and I'm incredibly responsible. But the character that I was playing was absent-minded and a dreamer and whatever. And the fact that this car kind of brushed me and I, it was like a really not a big deal. I just slightly went up on the bonnet or whatever. But I was just like, Oh wow! I am so in this character. I, I'm da like you're Daniel Day Lewis going. 
I was like, check me out. I am. I have become somebody else. And, <laughs> and I was. I was really proud of myself for nearly getting killed. Okay. So, but so I still haven't been able to unpack this though. So, because that's the thing. Because I do. I love that. I. That's what I feel like, and it makes me feel. That's when I'm happiest. When yeah. I'm like, you know, my character is moody and bitchy. So I spend three days, my poor husband can't like move because I'm like, I'm the emotional mess, girl, you know. Yeah. But then I think there is a tiny bit of myself that goes, oh my God, seriously? Like, mm -hmm. honey, you're not that precious. <laughs> like, in it is, do you think it's stupid then? Because the character doesn't know that they're moody or absent minded like your character. They don't yeah, know they are. I think, I, I think to me that to me that's really important that the characters have no self awareness, yeah. and and I suppose that I I, I wonder how, how healthy that is for for an actor because because I feel like the more self awareness you get, maybe unless you can entirely turn that off, like you know the, the, the more mature you are it's not necessarily going to help you i mean that sounds i mean i, mean, I know loads of actors who hate that who, who just sort of like you know it's all it's all technique and you don't have to do any of that nonsense um but for me i love you know for me i'm trying you know i'm I, I i like the idea of getting into character and i and i, I don't think i'd be annoying with it to, to, to anyone but um I think in terms of audio books, there are times where I'm playing three or four people talking to each other and I and, and there's a little voice in my head going, this is quite amazing and weird what you're doing. But it, but it, but as soon as I sort of enjoy it too much, then it then it disappears and I say the wrong thing. Because thing. you've just because I've the thought, omniscient Mark has just come in and gone, look yeah, what I'm yeah, doing. Yeah. And even, even even in the audition today, I, 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 there was a couple of times where they, the, the, the people, the, 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 the panel kind of really laughed when I was actually being particularly hurt. And I thought to myself, I'd have to, if, if they gave me that job, I'd have to, I'd have to resist the idea that that line was funny. Because as soon, as soon as I, as soon as I thought, that's the line where everybody laughs, then I, then I wouldn't be able to right. do it anymore. And then we're coming down and see what you're saying. It's like, it's what Anthony Mindel's always telling everyone. It's the, it's the learning how to let it all go. So you're not acting. So you're like, just not acting. But then the minute you try to tell yourself to not act, you've ruined it <laughs> because you're I mean, thinking I just, about I, it. I think in, 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 in the theater, I, I, what I, feel I've developed is just not even having no not really any consciousness of what I'm doing at all and and just entirely being very interested and very focused on on, on the other people and um and and and, res and responding to them and you know seeing what it what what, what they're going to do for me and that and that and that makes it easier because it doesn't require very much effort because you just go huh who are you, who are you what are you saying to me what what do i need to to say back to that but you do um, that in the audiobook as well it's just the other people are all coming from your head uh, I, I, fi I find it harder to do that in in, in an audiobook I, fi I find um i find my energy in an audiobook different to that i mean, i get uh I, I tend to only ever record for an hour and a half uh, max, uh, and, I'm, and, and I always think mm, I should be able to do I should be able to do longer than that because um, I because I know I've done performances longer than yeah, that. Yeah, it that's um, that's a that's a that's a weird path to go down, and it's not the, there's no should there's no should. I can record a lot in a studio. I can record less at home. I can record more at home right in different times of my life different books 
Some people record scary amounts at home. Some people, some of the best narrators in the world don't. Like Simon, Simon Vance was on here and he's like, yeah. you know, a god of a narrator. And he mm -hmm. just casually said, oh yeah, well, I just record something like, I record two hours usually. From, I, I, I'm going to get this wrong. But it was something like, I record two hours from like two to, from like 10 to 12 in the morning. And I'm like, oh, so like one finished hours? No, 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 two hours. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so, so no, wait a minute. <laughs> How long do they, <laughs> I mean, I might have the numbers wrong, but it was some scary, like, is there no, so I'm going to ask, I want to ask, because I've got tons of questions for you about the book and the yeah, energy yeah. of that, but I don't want to forget um, Anna's and Jonathan's questions. Um, Jonathan's I'll ask after Anna's. Anna says, how do you select the projects you narrate? Um, I don't. I pretty much uh, have done all the ones that people have asked me to do. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that because I think, Anna, <laughs> I think if you ask any narrator, it's more of a matter of if any if you can get the book because there's so much I mean, competition that, that, that's, that's very if, if if you're asking about audiobooks yeah if, if you if you're asking about i've 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 rejected a lot of uh theater um for a whole whole bunch of reasons i yeah. have i have a, i've i've really quite an impressive phantom cv of stuff that i didn't do um for one reason or another are you and, glad uh, or do you ever regret it um it's, it's obviously not helpful to regret it um and it's kind of speculation that you know what 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 might have happened if you if, if you'd done this and that quite a lot it's practical reasons family reasons uh geographical reasons that there's other things because because that because the, literally because theater requires you to be in a certain location for a certain number of weeks Where, whereas an audiobook, um, A, you're not tied to a, a certain day or days. And yeah. so I've done audiobooks while I was also doing theatre. Um, you, you, you know, or you've paused it and then done it or crammed it in or blah, 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 whatever. Um, so I've, I've turned down a lot of theatre. I try to make it about the characters in, 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 the, in, the, the, in the theatre sense. Um, and uh, sometimes the pro you just sort of think mm, I'm not totally convinced about about this project uh, for one reason or another. But then sometimes it's just clashes. Uh, yeah, it turns, it's different. But, I, but I, yeah, it's a different it's a different thing. I have I don't I don't a, 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 apart from sort of books about like crypto cryptocurrency, you know, which I'm sure like, all narrators get offered mad things about oh yeah they send us emails you guys they send us emails jonathan yeah, have gotten yeah. these as well they send us emails i had one would you like to do my book on keto dieting and yeah. i'm willing to pay you one pound one dollar for the entire book yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. okay yeah. but i mean but the thing is the other thing I've noticed, and I never, I would have thought before I started that it, that I wouldn't have done this because I have to pay my mortgage. So I've taken books on that are like nonfiction and like nothing I would ever read ever in my entire life. But when you get the book, you have to take it seriously. You, you don't take a book if you're not going to respect it. And I mm -hmm. always end up learning lessons. Right. Like, do you not find you read things that you maybe wouldn't read normally, but you're glad you um, did? I have done loads of nonfiction. Um, I did a book about learning to pass your driving test, but I completed that in a day. So, um, and it still sells. Um, I certainly, I did a book about um, uh, teaching English as a foreign language. Definitely learned about lesson planning from that. Um, so this, this, I'm going to, so this brings up Jonathan's question and it leads into my question, John. So when did you start narrating? So the first book I did, I think was in December, 2019. 
Okay. So uh, you beat the COVID crowd. You started like. Yeah, that was kind of before. annoying. It was a bit like, I literally thought of this five months before you all guys. Yeah. Uh, and I already had my stuff. <laughs> And uh, it was my idea, not yours. Uh, <laughs> we all think that. We all think that. I'm like, <clears throat> why did so I, I just miss when all the narrators had the easy books and the publisher books? And we all started yeah. just a little later than I, we would have liked. I'd, I'd been kind of playing around with stuff um, for uh, a couple of years before, but um, I hadn't. I hadn't sort of dedicated. A, a space and I hadn't kind of made a studio and I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so it was, it was in the December um, before COVID that I did the fir my first sort of full novel. Okay, I want to talk about this. I want to talk mm. <clears throat> about that book. I mean, you're mm. gonna, he's going to think I'm a crazy person by the end of this call because that book, but I am really, really, really thinking deep and hard about because you talked about the actors that rely on technique right. and, and, and I get that. And I saw that in theater as well. And some of those people, I mean, they have worked. I mean, they, they're flawless. They're flawless. They're like masters at their technique. And, but I just get this feeling and I specifically get this feeling since doing audiobooks that there is an energy and it doesn't matter what you do to develop, to deliver an honest, tell me if, stop me if I'm being a pre, if I'm being, the word precious keeps coming to mind tonight, but I feel like I'm being like, oh, I'm an actor, but it's, there's a, a you have to be honest because you're talking into someone's ear close up. So yeah. there's a human connection and people respond on a subconscious level to your energy and mm -hmm. i know for a fact that your energy in that book you were a re you were just you were alive you were enjoying where you were no amount of technique could deliver what you delivered in that those two books actually and there mm -hmm. was another book i won't i won't say what it was because i think what it was with the other book was you had jumped in and it wasn't the first in the series Right. So I didn't understand really what was going on. And it kept like, to make you understand, it was such a long series to make you understand what was going on. You had to have like, mm. they had to keep explaining what was going on. And so I haven't really given it a chance. I'm going to go back and listen. But you still delivered that energy. And I don't know if it's from your years as an actor. I don't know if it's something you're consciously doing. Do you prepare when you go in the booth? Do you have to... Do you have a trick for how you set aside Mark who might be grumbling and pissed off at someone that day? If Because it's not just easy. Everyone's just, you have to leave it at the door, right? Mm. How do you do that? <laughs> well, that's a good question because um, I think one of the things that's odd about recording at home is that I'd realized that I'd got, I'd got so used to the rhythm of... It take, especially when I lived in London. So basically one of the reasons I did now do audiobooks is because I moved away from London, giving me the size of house that had enough space, uh, well, specifically a fifth bedroom, that I could turn into a studio, which is largely why I hadn't done it in, in London. But I got very, I'd got so used to the routine of it taking a certain amount of time to travel to the theater or wherever that yeah. that was that was that was that was partly my sort of preparation time that i moved from and you and you put beside you uh, behind you the role of <clears throat> father husband son whatever all those roles you have in your life and become uh you know this person who doesn't have all, all of that yeah, stuff you're Physically and, moving to another place. Yeah, and so it, it, I, I have not always found it easy to go, oh, now I've done the school run and I can immediately, I can start work in five minutes, you know, and I'm not necessarily ready for that. And I've all, and I was very used to the rhythm of, I really enjoyed 
uh, the, the, the sort of my personal warm up. Some people do loads of warm up, some people don't, and it's all fine. And I'm not, uh, you know, I wouldn't think anything of somebody who did no warm up at all, or, or somebody who spent an hour doing whatever. I I quite like doing yoga before a theatre performance. I'm not saying I don't even. Uh, I'm not claiming it makes any difference particularly, but I, I sort of. That's fueled by feeling that I owe a certain amount of preparation time to the people who are paying money to come and uh, come and see it. But hey, it's it's just as good for me anyway to do it. So like, yeah. it's really not. A, it's not really not a chore, and um, you know, uh, and, and, and enjoy enjoy sort of getting ready for all of that and um, and focusing and, uh, and 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 creating that kind of magic um at, it at, is at, it really uh, is you guys i'm gonna put the book link in the about section it really is the two other books i've enjoyed that much time travel one is the johnny heller sean inman oh my god I, I didn't sleep for like a week while i listened to that book but and the stephen king and yours and thanks. thank you mark you were responsible for about three nights of me not sleeping <laughs> because <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, so I, I, I it, but it is a thing I struggle with because part of me, part of me is like, just go in and just start recording. Yeah, see, that's and, how I uh, think. You know, and and some, and, and I really struggle with that because the the, the best audio book I think I've done um, is a book called Devils and Saints, which is a translation of a French book, and I, for, for a lot of that, I I redid stuff, I, I redid loads of bits of that. Um, where I did sections and then I just thought I can do that better and you know later on in the day I went in and, and, and did a whole bit again and um, and I and, 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 and it's the thing that I'm, I'm it's the thing that I'm the most proud of um, and it and you know, and I'm kind of kicking myself because I'm like, do you know what? It didn't really take that much time because if I did, if I if I did a bit that was forty five minutes, and then I did that forty five minutes again, whoa! I've wasted forty five minutes at the, at the at the most, you know. Um, so really, that wasn't really that big. A, that's nothing. That's hardly anything, really. But, but do you think you're a happy person? Like, do you think that your nature? is the underlying ingredient? Uh, no. <laughs> no? I think I'm, I, I think I'm, I, I, I toyed with the idea of describing myself as an optimistic nihilist. I'm pretty sure that life is pointless <laughs> and it doesn't amount to anything <laughs> at all. And we're just wasting our time. But I kind of hope <laughs> I, and, I believe that somebody can, that I'll change my mind. And that it will all be marvelous, you know. But no, hang on. But you know, there's loads of times where I, 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 I find the beauty in, in in the simplest things. But equally, I can be crushed by um, the tiniest things too. So I, 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 I don't know. And and sometimes. But let me. So I want to. I'm going to take that thought one step further. So who are you when you go into the booth? Is there a critical mark analyzing what he's doing? Is Absolutely. there a mark thinking Maybe. he's uh, However, I, what, what I would say is that I'm not analysing my performance at all because literally the only thing I care about is sound quality. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Oh, that's I interesting. Just, I just, and, you know, it's the reason I'm not a great, it's not, the reason I'm not a famous singer is because, and I've taught, I, I, I've taught singing and I've taught a lot of singers and I've taught, and I've, and every time I've taught singers, I've tried to teach them about their performance, but when it comes to singing, I can only think about the sound and the tone. And I really oh, wow. want to tell them that's not what it's about. It's about the communication, it's about the story. And there's a big part of me that just goes, who cares about the communication and the story? How does it sound? What's the sound? You know, and um, and I've and I've and I've taught like loads and loads of people, and been really moved and blown away by by people who aren't even professionals, 
um, who have done wonderful, beautiful, moving performances because they've done what I told them to do. And, um, and I just don't do that myself. And I can't take my own um, direction or tips or, and I'm so, you know, and so if, when I'm editing, I'm just going, this just sounds hideous. I can't bear yep. to hear. Do you know what? I'm, I'm going to interrupt you again because this is really timely because I learned a very big mm -hmm. lesson. I hope I hope this is going to go down in the records as a lesson and it's not just going to be a very sad ending. But about four <laughs> years ago, I started getting a hoarse voice, which is right. kind of how it sounds now. I used to go to voiceover jobs and be, mm -hmm. I used to be able to make my voice so smooth and velvet that like the corporate clients would be like embarrassed because it was like bordering on like sexy, smooth and velvet. <laughs> like I could see the look on their face, like in China. Yeah. And I used to be kind of proud of like my gorgeous, sexy voice. Mm -hmm. But then I started getting like a cough and hoarseness and it caused right. me problems in theater. It was the last few times I, I was doing like We Macbeth and I was like, mm -hmm. you know, I sounded not like myself. And then I struggled for four years. The cough got worse. The hoarseness got worse. Um, right. And they never told me what it was. They send you for all those tests and everything. And then just recently, I won't make a big story about this because we're running out of time, but I found out that I had the LPR silent reflex where acid goes in your throat, right? Huh. And and it's it's it changes your voice. You can completely right. change your voice. You end up breathing through your mouth. And it, so I didn't sound mm -hmm. like myself. And I had to, to keep being a narrator full time, I had to completely let go of the thought of having a beautiful or young or sexy or even versatile voice. And I had right. to completely like overdo my focus on characters and telling the story and I had to, cause I couldn't do it. The tool wasn't there. So I had to like, at least try to be the best actress I could be. I'm not, I don't know whether I succeeded or not. I mean, I have my ups and downs and there, I recently found a thing that's a cure was that supposedly it's got a high success rate. It's on the NHS for mm -hmm. reflux and silent reflux. And oh, I tried wow. it for like a week. Mm -hmm. And just the other day I went in the booth and my sexy voice, just for one day, it didn't last. I'm hoping yeah. using my sexy voice was back. I mm -hmm. literally almost didn't know what to do with myself. I mean, I'm saying sexy, but it was the smooth, yeah, yeah, yeah. not yeah. hoarse. And mm -hmm. having had my voice taken away from me, the voice I liked and was used to, taught mm -hmm. me, forced me to yeah. rely on it. It's like you lose your sight. You have to start listening. So mm -hmm. that's the way to stop because, because as long as you can teach anyone you want, but as long as you know that if you work on it, you can sound great, you're never going to stop listening to it, are you? Unless you get the crappy voice. <laughs> you have to like, like today, so like um, driving back from this audition, I was, I was listening to an audio book and I was just like, I can't, the, the, the sibilance on it, I can't. I can't believe anyone's published this. It's it's just it's just horrible. I can't I can't listen to it. And it was you know um, very successful narrator, um, professionally produced. But I was here. But and and I think that other people could listen to it and and not have a problem with it. So I'm I'm not really even criticizing this. I'm not saying that it's even a fact that that was very sibilant it's just that i was hearing it because i hear it as a thought in myself so i, I i'm then aware you know, you know and i i sometimes in daily life i have to remind myself that i can't isotope other people around me um, <laughs> yeah yep yeah. but i told you i did it i'm hypercritical sometimes now yeah, I'm listening yeah, to audiobooks really, i can't enjoy them i can't yeah. i can't edit them the, but the person that pronounced that word that I, I'm not going to say in case it's a proper pronunciation, I don't want to offend anyone, but yeah. I could literally punch the narrator and I really wanted to hear the rest of the story, but uh, they kept saying that word. Yeah. It's, you know, but I think as long as your, your perfectionism doesn't get in the way of your acting and it doesn't. So um, 
Well, I, you know, I like to, so I don't, um, for that reason, I don't, I don't punch and roll, which makes me feel like an amateur, but I like to give myself alternate takes and then hear them afterwards and see what I think. And because I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be too thinking about how it sounds at the time. So I know that everybody says that's what, you, you know, to be, to sort of move forward, that's what you need to do. But I, I've resisted doing that so that I can listen and go, I, I can just throw off some options um, of tricky bits or accents or, or bits that I, I want to, you know, give, yeah, give some alternate things. Yeah, I have but to I, punch and roll. I've only ever learned how to punch and roll. I, I don't think I would be able to do it any other way because it's the way I learned. No, sure. And, you know, I'm, I, 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 I can't believe I confess that to you, really, because um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> you know, I know, I, I, I know all about it and I understand why um, you would want to do it. But for, for, I, I know some of my listeners have the same hesitancy and and took a while to face. it kind of goes back to what i said about five hours ago whenever it was about 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 doing the three years university in the three years yeah. practical acting training is that is that one's talking the talk and one's walking the walk and i and, and i think it's quite difficult to do both at the same time and so um i am trying when i'm narrating to not be overly conscious about the effect of it i'm trying to just do it and i will deal with the effect later yeah and you and i'm a, i mean i'm a huge i i am would love to be able to capture even a tiny bit of what you did in those two books as a narrator and i've been doing this for years now and i've been doing it killing myself interviewing what over 170 people trying right. to find the je ne sais quoi that's going to make me happy, that uh, it's going to make me go in and go. And every once in a while, I get it. But mm -hmm. you did two books, two entire books, consistently with a pure, just pure connection in two books. And that's astounding to me. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, you know, and 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 I think we uh, had this in emails initially. There are there are people who disagree with you, uh, uh, people who didn't like them or me. Yeah, they or have no people. taste. They don't know what they're talking that's, about. Um, <laughs> so it's amazing. It's amazing that it's amazing that some people and, and I think you know, audio but it seemed to me to be a particularly personal thing, and the. Um, well, no, I no. See, yes, I know that it's subjective, but no, but good is good, and those two books are good. There's, there's no. Some people would like them, some people wouldn't. And also, I don't read my, I don't read my reviews. I have somebody check them for feedback that I might need, I, and I, I don't I wish look I at them. But uh, I do. But you shouldn't. I think, I think, a thing that comforted me was, um, I last year I got to work with my personal acting hero is a guy called Michael Maloney, who I'd um, seen at the Royal Shakespeare Company when I was kind of 17. And uh, it was kind of always my idol. And um, and I, he did the audiobook of Captain Corelli's Mandolin. And wow. there, there are thousands and thousands of, of reviews on that. And, you know, some of them absolutely love it and some of them absolutely hate it. And I, you know, you can never take away from me that he's my acting idol. So I was just like, huh, well, you know, it means, it, it, that says to me that, that any book, there are going to be, and, and, and the more, and the, and, the, and, the, and the more popular it is, the more famous it is, the, the, the more there's going to be some people who want to or whatever. And, you know, the, however many people say they don't like it, I, you know, he's my acting idol and, blah, blah, blah. So there just are going to be people who, who don't like it. I mean, but then, but then some of the reviews are bizarre because there's, there's one review that said that a lady said my voice was abhorrent 
but she gave me five stars. So I thought, well, either she's pressed the stars wrong or abhorrent doesn't mean what she thinks it means. No, or she's just had a bad day. It's literally <laughs> nothing to do with, it's literally the people, the people that are your listeners that are listening to your stories, the people that, let me put it this way. The people that matter are Anna. Yes. Anna matters because mm -hmm. they're the people that feed us. They feed us. And and I don't know what Anna does for a living. She's sitting here going, stop saying my name. I never <laughs> agreed to be like in the limelight. <laughs> but I don't know what she does for a living. But I think people that enjoy someone's work and have the generosity of spirit to show mm -hmm. up and and to and to, to i mean because if you see how much a bad review affects an artist when they put their heart and soul into something a good review a person like anna a person that you know someone's out there listening to you you're mm -hmm. sweat and blood and you're trying so hard to tell a story and you know there's someone that you're doing it for and it's well, Anna you do it for. That it's, it's, it's one of my favorite things that um, I, uh, somebody at drama school said to me is that, you know, and again, this is a concern like, you know, sort of precious actors nonsense. But th th there, was, there was talk about the person who spends their last uh, 20 bucks, pounds, whatever it is, on going to the theater uh, when they could have done all sorts of other things with yeah. that and and, uh, and that and that seems to be a th big thing on audible doesn't it you know you don't waste a credit on this or this is well yeah yeah it's you but, know but it's somebody who somebody who does somebody who does do that and so uh you know the idea the idea that you're doing it for that person um who who, who is who is putting their chips on on you as opposed to somebody else that that is a, that that is a, a motivator for me. I I, I love the idea. I, I do I do love the idea that you're you're doing it for somebody who's taking a chance on you. Who's going? Well, I, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna I'm gonna take a punt on this, and um, you can uh, you, you can you can give them something satisfying. Yeah, and you and Anna says for her audiobooks are a way to relax on her way home from work. So right. you're telling the story. You, I was like. I thought my life was over. I've just, like every few months or something, I come up with the thought that, oh my God, is, oh, what am I doing in the world? And then, and your mm -hmm. audiobook, although it deprived me of sleep, it <laughs> made me happy. Now I can't right. even remember what all the fuss was about. Right, Luckily, right. I've got a short attention span. I never get depressed for long, but your audiobook cheered me up. And I think that that's, that's, those are the people to focus on. The yeah. people, the people that care. That's why I don't, I get the feedback I need from my reviews, but I have a colleague I trust to give it to me Okay. and I give them theirs and we don't right. ever read our own reviews. So mm -hmm. I'm not blindly just, oh, if nobody likes me, I'm not going to pay attention, but yeah, I don't have to like Jimmy that's had a bad day and has just ordered seven pizzas. He's pissed off at me mm -hmm. because I sound like his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, was, I think the, the review that convinced me to not watch mine was the one that said that I should never be allowed to speak out loud again in front wow. of anyone. It was like my first book I'd ever <laughs> done. <laughs> I've gotten some good reviews and I thought I was like Miss Narrator yeah, and yeah, this yeah. person was like, worst voice in the entire world. Yeah. I think he said that I sounded like I had like a beard and horns. I mean, it was just a really mean, yeah. and who needs that? You've got Anna, uh, yeah. you've got me, <laughs> you've got Jonathan. <laughs> Absolutely. I had okay. a friend who said I sounded like, um, oh, what's the pop star's name now? They, they basically meant it as a, they meant it as a criticism, but I was like, oh, wow. I sound like that guy. Okay, that's, that's actually how I found it quite a nice thing. Do you know the name? You don't know the name. Oh, what's the name of that guy? Is it? He, he's a bit of a marmite guy. Um, what's his name? How you... What's a marmite guy? Oh, you know marmite. Like you. I know what left... marmite is. It's that brown jello you, or something. You love it or you hate it. It's the Australian thing. 
Australian. I thought Marmite was Australian. Very dare you. No, the Australians have a completely different thing. I've lived but in the UK for 20 cannot, years. I have cannot, no excuse, huh? So we cannot even speak the name of the Australian monstrosity. Okay, you're not going to get away without answering this one last question, please, okay. that I ask everyone. Um, for the YouTube audience that's going to be watching this in the next 60, 80, mm -hmm. 90 years, there's only like 40,000 of them. Yeah. What final last words would you like to leave them with? If they walked away with nothing else from this call, but one thought, what would you like to leave them with? Wow. Um, so I will try to conclude some of the things we've said. We talked about confidence. I wanted to say to you that I don't think I've ever had that. I don't believe in it. I don't think it's a thing. I think there is um, doing things a number of times until you feel better about what it is that you're doing, but I don't believe that I have it. I, I don't feel that it's like a coat that I have that other people can't wear. So okay. that's just work. That's I just like that. Doing stuff again and again. I've never felt nervous. You asked me if I felt nervous in, um, I feel really nervous in auditions because I didn't know what's going to happen, but I've never felt nervous uh, in the theatre because I've prepared a lot. Um, I do feel nervous. I, I do slightly procrastinate before I go in the booth because I, I stupidly worry that the recording session will be terrible because I'm awful and I don't know what I'm doing. And I worry about, I think that every day. So, um, most of the time I managed to forget about that after five or so minutes, I guess. And I forget it. And then I realized that I've forgotten what I was thinking about. So I become absorbed in it and I become occupied. And I think everyone needs something that occupies it and that, that occupies me. So it, so it is my occupation by default because it, because it makes me forget everything else that I was worried about or was thinking about for the time that I'm doing it. And I kind, kind of never want it to end. Um, I hate the end of rehearsal when everyone goes home and I'm like, Let, let's just carry on. Let's me just... too. Me too. I'm like, <laughs> really? Did you not have as much fun as I did? Why would you want to yeah. leave? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I suppose that, um, and so my dream is to not have to ever listen back to anything that I've recorded so just keep recording some more stuff. Okay, and can you please ask that right? I, I'm, again, please excuse my disgraceful being horrible at names. The one with the two books. Can you please tell him so, from my those... voice to his ears, can Mark record your third book quickly? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's, got, he's got like seven or something. Um, okay, all of them. Yeah. Um, check out Need a Little Time. Check out System Restored. Um, I I love them. He's also got a podcast now called Retro List, which is which which I was like, is very odd hearing the voice of an author that because I thought I was embodying his voice. Yeah. And then he sounds completely different from me. So that was yeah. that was. That's you amazing. never will. It'll always be your own. <laughs> so, but yes, you must do another book for him soon. Yeah. It's it's well, a great yeah. combo. His writing and your voice are perfect. Thank you very much. So, yes. Yeah, so, I you can quote me on that, please. Yes. <laughs> Anna will back me up there. So, thank you so much, Mark. This has oh been God. a pure joy. It was a lovely talk. And you've given me a brilliant idea as well in completely off the subject so um this has been a wonderful call and i'm glad we had it and i can't wait to post it let me know if there's any links that you want to add to the about section or anything any upcoming shows or anything where i can happily add it and mm -hmm. i really appreciate your time this was the call we needed to have tonight and thank you and